Good morning. Good morning. And welcome you to Homewood Church where we gathered on this Christ the King Sunday. This is the last Sunday of this current church year. Next Sunday begins the new uh, church uh, year as we will be beginning the Advent season. Uh, so it is good to be in the house of the Lord this day as we remember uh, who Jesus is and what he is, has promised and that he is to come again. And so as we worship today, we will be celebrating the Lord's Supper together a little later in the service. Uh, and so I just uh, ask that you begin preparing your hearts uh, already uh, for this time. Uh, before we do get started, before I hand this over to Miss Melissa this morning, I do have a few announcements that I would um, like to mention this morning. Uh, the men's, uh, neither the men's nor the women's Bible studies will meet this week with Thanksgiving uh, happening. So... Uh, please take uh, note of that. Uh, also, the Christmas cantata uh, will be taking place on December 18th during morning worship. We did this um, uh, last year, and we're going to do this again this year. It was a great uh, turnout, so we'll be doing the cantata on uh, Sunday, December 18th. You can invite your friends and family. Uh, go ahead and let them know, hey, this is what we're going to be doing. It's going to be a wonderful um, uh, cantata. Um, today, if you had uh, your uh, Christmas shoebox, um, um, they are due today. Melissa is going to be taking them this next week, tomorrow. I'll make a come today and take them tomorrow. Yeah, today or tomorrow. Uh, and so we thank you for those of you who have prepared uh, Christmas shoeboxes already. Next Sunday, uh, we will be uh, receiving our loaves and fishes boxes, uh, the little box that are up here on the front pew. So. You want to bring that uh, we're going to be uh, dedicating uh, those uh, boxes for for uh, Samaritan's purse today as well as the, um, the loaves and fishes next week uh, today we will have a, a session meeting at 1 30 uh, so elders your your elder packet if you haven't already got it is in the office uh, but we will be uh, here today at 1 30 and then today also beginning at 1 o'clock from 1 to 3 p.m. the joy gallery will We'll have its opening show for our latest artist, uh, William Harrison. It's a beautiful show. Uh, if you like looking at uh, mountainscapes and, and wildlife uh, been captured in, in art, um, Sydney and I have been watching the show Let Yellowstone uh, on TV, uh, and there's quite a few of the paintings that, I think a few of them are called Yellowstone, uh, but it really does just beautiful uh, mountainscapes. Uh, so uh, if you'd like to see that, I invite you to stop by the Joy Gallery today or come back between 1 and 3 and meet the artist and uh, maybe learn a little bit about what inspires him. And as you, if, if, when you see the show, you'll know that he is very much inspired by that, the nature and the beauty of nature and the creation um, of God. So, uh, but that is taking place uh, here today. With all that said, I want to turn this over to Miss Melissa this morning for our children's message.
last announcement that I failed to mention. Uh, we have the Christmas poinsettias and order forms uh, that are available in the pews. Uh, they're, they're just at different places uh, around the church. Um, but the poinsettias this year will be $20, and we are not going to have them uh, in the sanctuary uh, for the entirety of the of the Advent season. Uh, we're gonna have the order forms due by September 4th. They will be here in the sanctuary on December 11th. De what, December 4th? Oh, I said September. <laughs> Where am I? <laughs> December 4th is when the order form is due. We will then have the Cornsetias here on December 11th. So that's the way it's gonna work. You can fill out your form. You can give it to Dolores, or you can place it in the offering plate, um, um, as we've always done. Eric, yes. Yes. I, yes. And then again, we will not have ladies' Bible study nor men's Bible study this week due to uh, the Thanksgiving holiday. With that said, I want to invite everyone to stand this morning as we are called to worship. Today is Christ the King Sunday, and we are here to proclaim the reign of Christ over all of our lives and over this world. So again, wherever you see bolded, italicized text in the bulletin, that is when you are invited uh, to join in with me. Let the heavens be glad and the earth rejoice. The earth is robed in majesty and girded in strength. God has established the world, and God's realm will never be shaken. God will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with equity. The kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord. Christ will reign forever and ever. Let us pray. Jesus Christ, our sovereign and savior, you pour out your power for the powerless and your salvation for the lost. Remember us in your new creation so that we may live in peace with you in the presence of the Holy One to whom be all honor and glory through you and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. We begin this time of worship this morning, the singing of hymn number 790. We'll sing verses 1 and 3 of We Gather Together. So this day, especially on the week of Thanksgiving, let us give God thanks for how he has brought us together to his table as his family and given us the meal of life. 
Mighty God, we celebrate your sovereignty known to us in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. We give you honor and praise and watch and pray for your coming realm of righteousness, justice, and peace. Above all earthly powers, you alone claim our adoration and allegiance, Christ Jesus. You have claimed each of us through our baptism and made us your commonwealth of priests. Help us as we remember our baptism to understand that you are the first and the last, beginning and the end, the Alpha and Omega. Amen. In Christ, God came to reconcile all things, making peace through the blood of the cross. It is trust again God's grace that we are able to confess our sins. So let us do so now, first silently, and then together with our prayer of confession. Let us pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us now pray together. Righteous God, you have crowned Jesus Christ as Lord of all. We confess that we have not bowed before him and are slow to acknowledge his rule. We pledge allegiance to the powers of this world and fail to be governed by justice and love. And in your mercy, forgive us. Raise us to acclaim him as ruler of all, that we may be loyal ambassadors, obeying the commands of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. God has rescued us from the power of evil and claimed us for the realm of Jesus Christ, in whom we have redemption. Friends, believe the gospel. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven.
Old Testament reading this morning comes from Jeremiah chapter 23, verses 1 through 6. I want to invite you, brothers and sisters, to listen carefully, for this is God's word. Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, declares the Lord. Therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning the shepherds who care for my people, you have scattered my flock and have driven them away, and you have not attended to them. Behold, I will attend to you for your evil deeds, declares the Lord. Then I will gather the remnant of my flock out of of all the countries where I have driven them, and I will bring them back to their fold, and they shall be fruitful and multiply. I will set shepherds over them who will care for them, and they shall fear no more, nor be dismayed, neither shall they be missing, declares the Lord. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely, and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In his days Judah will be saved, and Israel will dwell securely. And this is the name by which he will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I want to invite you to stand as we continue in worship. The singing of hymn number 786, verses 1 and 4 of Count Your Blessings. that couples don't 
always have on the forefront of their mind uh, is being exactly honest with the other one about what their expectations are. And I always remember there was a time where I was meeting together with a couple, and I won't say their name. You wouldn't know them anyway if I said their name. But I was uh, talking with them and sharing with them, and I asked them this question, what are your expectations for one another? You as a, a bride-to-be, what are your expectations of your husband-to-be? And husband-to-be, what are your expectations of your bride-to-be? Uh, and the groom, which usually in those situations, the groom is always a quiet one. And so he defers to his bride-to-be. To which she said, you know, I really have no expectations. To which I then laughed. <laughs> Began laughing. Saying, no, no, you've got expectations. You've got expectations for this lifelong covenant that you're about to enter into. You have expectations for this one. Because there's no other relationship to me that demonstrates that we have expectation and hopes and dreams than that of the marital relationship, right? When we look around and we see married couples, we look around and we see when they're first married how happy and jovial they are. And then it grows into this wonderful family. And when you start seeing children being born, it's, it's nothing but expectation. <coughs> and then I said, let's try it again. Ma'am, what is your expectations for your husband to be? To which then she doubled down. Honestly, I have done. And I began thinking, is this going to be a marriage? Is this going to be, do y'all understand what we're talking about here? No, weddings and marriages and relationships have expectations. Over the course of our time together, I finally did get them to talk about that. And I shared with them what I was meaning by, for whatever reason, this couple was thinking expectations are bad. We're not supposed to have them. But we have them. We have expectations in everything that we do and the relationships that we're in. Now, some of those expectations might be lower than others, right? I found it very easy in life to enter into any situation, any situation with low expectations. That's my rule for life. Whenever a child is born in our congregation, I get to hold the baby for the first time. You know what I whisper to that child? I say, welcome to this world. Prepare to be amazed and disappointed. <laughs> it's life so I like low expectations I like when I meet someone that I'm not going to put something on them that they're not really probably you know it's not fair for them to have on them because I know just in my <laughs> own life what expectations can do and the stress and the anxiety that they bring with them but here we are on Christ the King Sunday, and we're celebrating an expectation that has been given to us. Christ the King Sunday is the, the last Sunday on the calendar of the church, and it precedes the first Sunday of Advent, which Advent is a word filled with expectation. Uh, Advent means uh, uh, coming, beginning, waiting, right? That's the whole, what the whole Advent season is about. It's about us waiting for the return of Christ by remembering how the Israelites were waiting on the birth of the Messiah and it connects the two together that the birth of the Messiah was something that had been expected it had been talked about in the family of God and they were expecting a Messiah a Savior and for the I guess two or so thousand years of this of this expectation many people had said many many things about what was to come what are we to expect well this is going to be a great and glorious day the expectations of the people of God when they were hearing from the prophets of God about what to expect and what were they to expect well this coming king this coming shepherd, 
this coming uh, person that is going to be reigning in justice and in peace. Which then sets the mind going into all kinds of directions. Which is what we know what the Old Testament is about. Again, I know y'all probably grow weary, but I'm remind, I just have to remind you every time we open the passages of Scripture, we open up the Bible. And especially when we read about the prophets and what the prophets are saying, they are, the prophets are speaking to a people who have been disobedient. And they have sinned. They have fallen away. And this disobedience has not been met with repentance. But instead it's been met with pride and hard-heartedness. And with pride and hard-heartedness and with sin comes the fragility of their lives. And so they always find themselves in these predicaments. Predicaments that maybe uh, they don't fully understand because they've not been fully obedient. But the prophets come along and they share with them a word of expectation. A word of something that they can look forward to. It's kind of like what we all do. We all know that. Whenever times are bad in our lives, what do we try to do? We look for the better day. If we've had a bad day at work, what do we do? Well, let's go home, get a good night's sleep. Maybe tomorrow will be better. When I worked at the bank, Sometimes it wasn't better the next day. Sometimes you went home and went to bed knowing that the next day that you wake up, it could be worse. And that something had to be worked out. Something had to be done. And there was a process that we had to go through. So the, the first part of that is, man, today was bad. We go get a good night's sleep. Maybe tomorrow will be better. Maybe it won't be better. <laughs> Maybe it'll be worse. Well, what do we say when it's worse? I'll just go home and get another night's sleep. Maybe tomorrow will be better. Maybe it gets better, right? We all have had situations where we've had to endure, where we've had to stop and evaluate where we are, why we're there where we are. At least we should be doing that. We should be whenever we find ourselves in times of great difficulty. And especially when in times of great difficulty there is a word of hope, which is what we have in the prophets. Though sometimes the prophets uh, are, are kind of harsh, in all of the prophets there's a word of hope. Every one of them. They're pointing us to a better day. They're pointing us to a better situation. And they're telling us to expect that. But they are also not wanting us to forget about the reality where we're in right now. Which is what happens with some of these expectations that we have. We separate them from our realities. Now in Jeremiah, what's the reality? What is a reality that's being talked about for the people of God? Well, there's a group of shepherds. When we think about the, the image of a shepherd in the Bible, it's kind of that image of a pastor. As a leader, think of the sheep who are supposed to be cared for, and there's a shepherd who's supposed to defend them and care for them and feed them and make sure that they're safe. And what has happened with these shepherds? Well, these shepherds are not working to see unity. They're not working to see life. They're not taking care of the, of the sheep that are in their flock. Instead, they are destroying them. They're scattering them. These shepherds, these pastoral people who were supposed to be caring for God's people have turned away. They've turned away for various reasons. Some of them have become numb. They've lost their first love. They've lost the, the, the sanctity of that ministry. Some of them have probably grown bitter with some of the sheep. I've never been on a, I've never been a shepherd as it relates to being around animals. I know Noble has. He knows, <laughs> no, Noble and Judy, they know um, it's, though you love the little goats, it's not always a pleasure 
to be around little goats. They can be messy. And they don't sometimes even realize that they're... I, I would imagine that none of your goats know that they're messy. They're just goats. <laughs> but as the shepherd, you have to take, take part in that. Some of the shepherds, I would imagine, that Jeremiah is speaking of, have been around their sheep, and they're just tired of the messiness. They're tired of having to deal with them. Some of the shepherds have probably found ways that they can take advantage of their shepherds, of their sheep. Uh, they can take advantage of them and use them for their own benefits. Some of them have been able to leverage their role as a shepherd uh, to, to care for only themselves. Right? There's many different reasons why these shepherds have turned away and why Jeremiah is telling the sheep. He's telling the sheep uh, to the people of God. He's, he's telling them, guys, y'all have been suffering under these shepherds, but there is a day coming. There's a day coming where there's going to be shepherds that are given to you that are going to, to love and do the things that they've been sent to do. There's going to be this king that's going to be raised up, which is Jesus, by the way. There's going to come this king that's going to, to rule wisely. He's going to rule with love and justice and righteousness. <coughs> but these folks that Jeremiah is talking to, I don't know if he wants to put this in here, but it's kind of there implied. Though that day is coming, that day is not today. So these people have to sit and think and wait in expectation on who this king is going to be. And we know that as Jesus, as we get closer to Jesus' ministry, uh, as we know when we see Jesus born, he's not born in the way that, that some people would, would think, right? If, if he is the Messiah, if he is the king, uh, he doesn't have a house that he's born in. He's born in a uh, and where the animals sleep there in this place called Bethlehem um, doesn't have a, you know, a whole lot of, of wealth around him. Lives up in one of the, uh, the, the more poorer communities up there in Nazareth. That's where he's going to live. And remember, people looked at Nazareth and looked down their nose at Nazareth the way that perhaps people out west in California or, or New York might look down on us who live here in Alabama. I remember when Cindy and I had the opportunity to go to Pennsylvania a few years ago to preach uh, in a church, and I showed up, and when the person introduced me, they said, here's our preacher from way down there in Alabama. <laughs> I imagine that if somebody had come from Nazareth and they were, pre they were, they were speaking, they would, somebody would have said, hey, here's our guest speaker from way up there in Nazareth. And then people just didn't look at them. This king, this one who is to be expected, is Jesus. But you look at where he's coming from, it's not in the expectations of the people. Now, they had had other expectations about who this Messiah was going to be. This Messiah is going to be great and powerful and wealthy, and he's going to be beautiful, and he's going to, he's going to have all the power. And this, this, this expectation of the Messiah has been impressed upon everyone. It's part of what drove the religious leaders, the shepherds, if I could call them that. It's, it's kind of what drove them to ask some of the questions that they asked. If this guy's going to be the Messiah, if this guy is the Messiah, if he's the Savior, he's sure hanging around a bunch of dirty people, hanging around these tax collectors, hanging around these women of the night of ill repute. Hanging around all these sick and ceremonially unclean people? Man, that's not what I was thinking of when I thought of Messiah or Savior or King. Some kind of King he is. Some of those shepherds had other expectations of what God was doing. But God has always been in the business of defying our expectations. The people of Israel themselves should have been the individuals who knew to understand how God has defied expectations. 
For God took Israel, which was a small people, a poor people, and, and he, he chose them to be his ambassadors to the powers of the world. They themselves were a miracle of how God is, how God is using the, the, the weak things of the world to shame the strong. And the ultimate, the ultimate spot where we see this coming king who is Jesus define the expectations of the people around him. And I printed it in your worship guide. It comes to us in Luke 23. At that place called Golgotha, the place of the skull, where Jesus is taken there, the king of the world, the savior of the world. He's taken there in a dirty, dirty place. Golgotha would have been kind of in the equivalent of the, the trash dump outside of town. It was not a place of comfort. It was a place of death and execution. The king of the world, the coming king, the Messiah, the Savior, is not there with all of the powers and all of his impressive robes and all the luxury. No, the reality of what we have been told to expect was one of death and tragedy. Where you have Jesus being mocked. He's been left alone. With the exception of the two people that he's crucified alongside. And so when we think about the expectations, we can even hear from the criminals themselves some certain bit of expectation on who Jesus should be. One of the criminals who was hanged next to Jesus railed at him saying, Are you not the Christ? Even a guy who's there on the cross next to Jesus has expectations about who the Christ should be. They're in the same place, in the same situation, but yet his expectations. Man, aren't you the Christ? Save us, save yourself. But then the other one, the other thief that was there, we can hear kind of the reality of the expectation, right? We see within him the hope that comes from expectation that's rooted in the realities in which we live. The other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God since you're under the same sentence of condemnation? Now, this guy was on the other side of Jesus. He's sitting there thinking, he's reflecting, he's mulling around in his own mind and in his heart what these expectations are and who this Messiah is. And he even knows who he is in the presence of this Messiah. We indeed are here justly. For we're receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And then he looks to Jesus. And he says, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, truly I say to you, today you will be with me. Friends, the expectations that I hope that we are taking from this and the expectations that we have as we enter into our life, as we enter into the places, is not to be unrealistic when we hear the promises of God over us. But that instead that we would take God's word for what it is. That where you are and the situations that you're in could be relationship issues, could be health issues, could be trying to figure out what am I going to do tomorrow, could be any, any level of difficulty that you're in right now. Know that you're not waiting for the day to come that Jesus saves you. Know that you're not waiting for some day that's just long beyond your grasp. <clears throat> no. But the expectation that we have in Jesus that we've been given to us 
is that right here and right now, just like in between those two thieves on the crosses there at Golgotha, the coming king and his kingdom is with you right here and right now. It doesn't mean that we don't look forward to the day when we enter into eternity, when we breathe our last here and we go into the presence of God. I'm not saying that's not what we're waiting on. What I'm saying is the life that we've been given in Jesus is meant to be lived now. The hope that we have in Jesus is to be experienced now. Even when the situation seems to be unfair, even when the situation seems to be too much for us to bear, the hope of the coming King and the kingship of Christ over us and in us, in our lives, is now. Because Jesus is with us. He's not far, far away. He is in our midst. And he has said to us, today, you will be with me in paradise. Amen. <coughs> Let us affirm our faith with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, from where he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Universal Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. But your reign is for all time, and your mercy is without end. In your love you made us to love and serve you. When we turned from you and bent our knees to gods of our own making, you spoke through prophets to bring us back to your ways. You gave us a vision of your holy kingdom, that we might hunger after righteousness and thirst for justice, and long for the day when peace will triumph over the pride and greed of nations. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with the servants around heaven's throne and with all the faithful of every time and place who forever sing to the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. You are holy, O God of majesty. And blessed is Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Born as King in David's line, he lived with the lowly and cared for the least of your children. His power was revealed in weakness, his majesty in mercy. His captors knelt to mock him, giving him bruises instead of praise, and piercing thorns for a crown. His only earthly throne was a cross on which to die. Even there, his arms stretched out to embrace friends and foes in love. From the grave, you raised him to your right hand, where he rules again from heaven and commands true loyalty from peoples and nations. We give you thanks that the Lord Jesus, on the night before he died, took bread, and after giving thanks to you, he broke it 
and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Remembering your gracious acts in Jesus Christ, we take from your creation this bread and this wine and joyfully celebrate his dying and rising as we wait the day of his coming. With thanksgiving, we offer our very selves to you to be a living and holy sacrifice dedicated to your service. Praise to you, Lord Jesus. Dying, you destroyed our death. Rising, you restored our life. Lord Jesus, come in glory. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these gifts of bread and wine, that the bread we break and the cup we bless may be the communion of the body and blood of Christ. By your Spirit, unite us with the living Christ and with all who are baptized in his name, that we may be one in ministry in every place. As this bread is Christ's body for us, send us out to be the body of Christ in the world. Lead us, O oh God, to conform this world to your kingdom of love, justice, and peace. Help us to live as the Lord requires, to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with you, our God. Keep us faithful in your service until Christ comes in final victory, and we shall feast with all your saints in the joy of your eternal realm. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, our glory and honor are yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Brothers and sisters, I'm going to invite you to, when I take the elements, I'm going to come forward, and you will come forward. I'm going to ask the choir, if you would, to come first. Uh, you will take uh, uh, the bread and the cup. You will return back to your seat. Uh, and once everyone has been served, uh, we will all partake together. If you have a difficulty coming forward, I invite you to just stay in your seat, and if I need to, I will come to you and bring the elements to you. Um, last thing I'll say, we all know this. This table does not belong to us. It belongs to the Lord Jesus. Therefore, all who trust in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior are invited to partake of this meal, for we are the family. Friends, come taste and see that the Lord is good.
thanksgiving. Let us eat and drink. salvation and joy to all the world. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Father God, we continue in our prayers this morning for our community and for our world. We pray, Lord, that you would be with all of our brothers and sisters uh, who are upon our prayer list, those who are battling illness, those who are battling loneliness, or those who are in a season of discernment, Lord, those uh, who are grieving, those, Lord, who do not know where to turn, Lord, we pray that you would be with each and every one of them. Thank God that as they live, that they would know uh, that you are with them, and that, Lord, that they would trust you. God, help us to be extensions of your grace and your ambassadors to them. Help us to care for one another and to stand for one another as we all live this life. God, I thank you for those uh, gifts that have been uh, given to us, uh, that we have been given, uh, that we are now giving to others. Uh, bless the Christmas shoeboxes that the children that, uh, Lord, that, that those would go to, that those children would be uh, given great joy during this season of Christmas. And let them know that there are individuals and that there are caring people in the world. And that, Lord, that they would not find their, their hope and their joy and their peace in these little boxes. But instead, Lord, that they would just learn the lesson that there are individuals uh, who, who stand for love and stand for grace. God, be with us and guide us uh, as we serve you. For we ask this in the name of Jesus and for his sake. Lord, we continue in the, with the prayer that Jesus has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We will close worship now with the singing of hymn number 670, verses 1 and 3 of Make Me a Blessing. Please stand.
Have a wonderful Thanksgiving with your friends, your family, with wherever it is that you are going, and know that I am very grateful and my family is very grateful to you and to this church for all of the, the love and, and all of the, the grace that you have given us. I, I count you all um, as a great blessing in my life, so thank you all. Receive now this benediction. Rejoice in the Lord always. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, with prayer and with thanksgiving, turn to the Lord. And know that the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard you in Jesus Christ. Go now in peace, brothers and sisters, to love and serve the Lord. Amen.